it is a pleasure, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to be with you today and to share. Now, as I, as I see, there are our professors on a very high level, and then uh, there are some of us who want to just know um, how to do it. So as a first uh, introductory thing, I will, oh, oh yeah, please stop me when I, when I uh, um, go on too long, see. So the first point, the first point I wanted to then share is um, the method of, of, of doing this. Now, when I started way back in 1987, it was one of those uh, funny things that I, um, I was frowned upon when I went to the archives. What is this man now uh, searching for? It, doesn't, it, it wasn't part of the, shall we say, brown, colored, koi, slave uh, tradition those days that people do their family research. Why I wanted to do it, we went to settle in Namibia, but we came back. And when I was in Namibia, I actually missed my family. And I decided that when I'm back in town, which we came back next year, when I'm back in town, I was going to uh, visit my family, find out more and so on. So I started with the oral history. That is approaching people and asking them. Um, then I got contradictory stories because some of our people, uh, according to them, came from Kimberley, and some of them came from Plettenberg Vale. Hello? Is it all right? Can you hear me? Okay. And then some came from Plettenberg Bay, and others had other stories. So I had to then uh, find uh, written uh, uh, evidence that may, may or may not correspond with the contradictory stories. And it was also very important in our day, we, we are of that previous generation, Shandre. Uh, when we asked our parents something, we would have, uh, we, we would have been uh, yeah, uh, chased away because children have to be seen and not heard. So we, we didn't have the courage those days to ask them. But as I was, when I was now a bit older, I was already a teacher by then, and a family did start opening up uh, to me. So then I realized I do have a structure where I should put in uh, my detail. So the structure which I discovered, I joined the Genealogical Society of South Africa, was a, um, a family tree. So this one here, you can see this one, it starts with Aubrey and then my pa my parents, first my dad, then my mum, and then their parents, my father's parents, my mother's parents. And so we could go on until I got to the first Springfield in Worcester, who was Aaron or Aaron. Now, I also got my mother's family here. Um, and then as you can see, there are still just gaps, you know. But that is also to reassure you that this is an ongoing process. We're not just going to wake up one day and everything is going to fall in place. Uh, at this stage for my life, it's also um, reassuring that there's something else to get up for tomorrow. Right? So having arrived at the oldest member, or the senior member, the first Springfield, the next step, was then to establish um, a family register. But now, how did I get here? After the oral research, I went to churches. Now, our Rhenish missionaries, which Mansell has uh, referred to earlier on, uh, Rhenish church um, ministers had very exact details of baptisms, of um, marriages, of deaths, and also uh, of people leaving the church. And a little bit more about how they have decided to baptize uh, uh, a certain person or not another person. So in some of the records, I would find this one, for example, of some of the relatives. And a little bit further, um, also one, my, one of my great, great grandparents who, um, was uh, where the commentary next to in general comments that he 
I had a changed heart for a long time and I was, I was at that stage then, 1946, uh, ready to make a commitment to the Lord. And that was and is still for me one great encouragement that people at the, as those days had to make a public confession of their, uh, of their, of their Christian belief. And they did that in the church. Now, from the um, records in the church, from there, I went into the um, archives. And the archives in the Western Cape and Roland Street has a lot of information for us. So there are documents about births and deaths, there are documents about wills, and also the uh, so-called death and notices of people, especially if they are property. A major help is that at some point, the Home Affairs had dropped some uh, files with uh, dates uh, with births and marriages, and those are also stored at the uh, at the Western Cape Archives. Now that helped me to then also um, eliminate the uh, the legends, the stories that people were told because. Our history was then just uh, communicated verbally because our parents, grandparents were so busy making a living that they didn't have time to write up stuff. And I don't know how it was in other communities, but in our community, when I was like a youngster, we, uh, we would play around when the family got together or friends got together. Our parents got together and then they would, the ladies would normally sit around and talk uh, and they would discuss everybody else and how people are connected, you know. And uh, the fathers would normally sit around and play dominoes or cards or things like that. But the mothers would not allow us into that conversation because it was it was adult conversation. So uh, we unfortunately lost a lot, and many of our people now struggle because they haven't listened. Because when we start getting interested in uh, our heritage, then our ancestors uh, want, who can tell us they are not there anymore. But in the groups that I have, I would normally recommend that we develop a kind of relationship with not just elders uh, in, our, in our family, but also the elders around our grandparents, neighbors, and once they realize that we are genuine and we're not here to um, sensationalize the past, then they are normally very prepared to share with us. And in that sharing, in that discovery of our past, uh, we actually uncover quite a lot. When I, for example, came to Aaron, my grandfather's grandfather, when I came to Aaron, it was it was such a feeling. It was it, I was overwhelmed. I went I went I drove up to um, um, Oak and I and I sat there in the car and I I actually I felt so moved. I was crying and then after that I could go home and could share it with my wife. I have found my uh, progenitor of Worcester, the first Springfield. Now. That had me to go and then search in the church records to confirm that he is the right Aaron. And the further connection was the, that what I discovered that day was that he was the daughter of Roset. Um, and there's Rosette's name as a slave of a certain person. Now, it's just for um, procedures that I'm, I'm, I've, I've covered his name. And then Aaron, here at the bottom, Aaron was born on the 13th of February, 1818, as the son of Rosette. Now, these things you discover in the archives, there's also, that is what I discovered, and that is what really touched me because I know he was a Rosette child. Although in the church registers, which I, I first had, in the church registers, they would normally write 
a Christian name or a baptism name. And that can be quite confusing because although a name was sort of set uh, in, the, um, in the slave register, that was the name that was given to the slave, uh, most probably by the owner and uh, or by the parents uh, with the permission of the owner. And then we can also go through auction lists and so on to find at what point uh, did that person actually join that farm or when did that person's parents join the farm. So I could, for example, go back and therefore we also go further than Aaron. I could not find Aaron's father and I could not, I could not find Aaron's mother, but because Aaron would be registered in the name of his mother only. Um, as Nigel has, uh, um, Mansell has said earlier on, we, we so often forget the mothers. And uh, the Latin expression mater semper certa est means the mother's identity uh, is, is a fact, whereas the father is not uh, uh, a fact that is pater in certus. And um, for me, it was also quite a, quite a lovely experience where we now this one to have gone into my mom's detail to get my mother's 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 line right up to mariana peterson and then i did for myself did the uh, dna testing and i wrote a long story about this dna testing but on my mother's side suffice it uh, it's probably uh, good to say that this company also went onto the international databases and discovered there were six people with an identical DNA as myself on this mitochondrial side, two in India, one in Sri Lanka, and three in the Maldives, which put it beyond doubt that Mariana Peters, my mother's 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 line, is, has been a slave uh, from that area or else a mother. So those that that gave me assurance of we belong somewhere. I know who I am. That coupled with Aaron's identity, and Aaron's identity shows that he is definitely of Koi Koi background. And then we speculate about this Koi Koi background that on the face of it, his mother, Rosette, had the right <laughs> to be intimate <laughs> with anybody. So she got married later to John Kibadu or Johannes Kibadu, whilst um, Aaron chose the surname Springfield when he got baptized. And that led me on to another line. There was Springfield and the Khoi Khoi clan of uh, Captain Dora, who, for example, came to the castle in 1693 to negotiate with the governor at that stage. And then we find on, under the Greek, Griqua, I found the Springfeld na name, and also under the Hesequas in the Hanandal area, there was Springfeld. And one of those Springfeld, for example, was uh, where he accompanied uh, the missionary from Hanandal to Ik Inon, to establish a new congregation there in the early 1800s. Um, I think I have, yeah, here, for example, it's a little map uh, that comes from the book on Fernandal, where we have Paula Springfeld's name. Um, and then on the same list, next his next door neighbor is Buzak, and then there's also Van Vogel there next to them. So it's a journey that gave me then a more a broader perspective. It was not just me, I am sure of my own identity. My family can be sure of their identi identity. I can be sure of my Christian identity, but I can also be sure of my Koi Koi identity. And now the world makes sense because now my perspectives develop. And my Christian perspective, perspective my worldview, still the same, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. But now my neighbors are not just me and my wife 
although the, the minister will say your wife is your first neighbor, right? But this, it, it, it went further. And the realization now is that I can start seeing my ancestors in their context. And this is the major meaning of the um, genealogical search for me, is that I can start projecting myself into the history. The history becomes real. It, it's now not anymore the 200 dates that we had to regurgitate, the facts that we had to learn uh, from the type notes of the teacher or lecturer uh, that had to include all his spelling errors so that we could get more than 80%. It was now, it is now, history is about me, my ancestors, and how their social, political, uh, religious influences played a role in their um, reality. And this is what we try to share also with my students. I, I, I would like to see that in, in every family there's at least one person doing that research and that I have said in the past and I normally take my students in first time into uh, the section, the inventory section, where there um, a volume of 17 thick books like these, research on 99% of our white families in South Africa, which was sponsored by the then government and um, people who were also volunteers. But we have to do it ourselves with our own funding and we have to be wise how we go about with our information. It's also one of the reasons why I ask uh, my students to be very careful when they go into these international, uh, uh, well, websites and uh, put down the information there that they can also know that uh, they, must, they must also be aware that that information is also accessible to everybody else and uh, copyright and so on would also be affected. Now, all the students, I am glad to say that Danny Titus, he is now not so well. Also ask you to say a special prayer for him. I do it every day. Uh, Danny Titus has initiated when he was the uh, executive person on Arctic of Fear uh, for culture. And he wanted to include the brown people as he calls them, colored people, koi koi, um, into um, those into the Afrikaner taal, Afrikaans taal and culture beweging and uh, And so Danny and the uh, Artica Fear ask whether I would start training people. And that's how Shanda and I then met and lots of other people. At this stage, there are 50 people actively busy with their family trees. After a certain period, we started off with six months, later on nine months, later on 12 months. After a certain period, we then have a, an exhibition. And that exhibition uh, is then the first opportunity for the students to actually share uh, amongst other interested people, their own family that they invite to, to this exhibition, to share what they have learned and how they have come about, uh, how they come about to, to get the facts on the table for the family. Um, one of my recommendations is that when people have done this, that they also um, do the after, after the funeral thing. You know, we normally have tea after the funeral, obviously now after lockdown, and then the family meets and then everybody says, we must get together before uh, the next funeral but that our genealogists can then use that opportunity to do a presentation, whatever, especially you, Charlene, you guys are very clever with the technology to do it. Uh, and then, so to become known as the genealogist of the family and the families. And the one thing leads to the other. When um, 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 
uh, Mansell talk early on about the uh, that that um, minister um, M C Foss is his name. Yes. A remarkable person. A remarkable person. Born again Christian. Um, going down, yeah, he's from the Bok family and so on, and going out to the Netherlands as the first Capetonian born, his grandmother was of, uh, of, of the slave background, and going out as the first South African Capetonian to become a, a minister in the Netherlands with his on his heart to bring the gospel to what they call those days the, sla the slaves and the heathen. Now, he, he, grow, he grew up as a burger. His parents were burgers. That means they were citizens. They were, uh, they were officially white, you know. And so he had this. And then my reading of the, he wrote the book on his own. It's one of my favorites also. Um, on his own uh, life. Uh, um, okay, by MC Force. <laughs> on his own life, his own biography and how he struggled with certain like political issues, for example, and politics will always come into the, into the story. He was interested in saving the souls of people for the Lord. But the situation those days uh, was that farmers were reluctant to get their workers baptized and saved according to the Christian principle, because there was the uh, statutes of, 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 uh, of Amsterdam, of India, statutes of India, which suggested that anybody, anybody who was baptized had to be freed. So at some point, MC Force had to make a very difficult decision, and that is to align with the government who allows him to be a minister to align with the and the, the Bura who would say, okay, you can baptize our slaves, but they must still keep their condition as slaves. So that was then uh, proved by the government of the time, and we uh, had to wait until 1834 for emancipation on the 1st of December. Now, I think I have covered most of it. Yeah, something about the Koi Koi and something about the slave ship that I put here. And then the main thing also for me here, which I've left out, is when we get down to our progenitor. Now, Aaron was in the first Springfield there in Worcester he was baptized on the 31st of March 1850 and these children will be the second group here then the children's children will be here the, the great the grandchildren so the great grandchildren so I have circled Niger, um, we have talked earlier on about starting with ourselves like here and going back and then getting there and then going this way. So I am here, Aubrey, and my sister's brothers, and then my children are there, but then my father and mother are there, then my grandfather and grandmother, his parents, and then eventually the uh, progenitor of Springfield of Worcester. Now, one of his grandchildren came to Cape Town, and the standard thing in Cape Town is people don't call you Springfield, they call you Springfield. So Jan Jacobus Springfield became John Jacobus Springfield, not John James, John Jacobus Springfield in, uh, uh, here in Cape Town. And it, it was wonderful, of course, one of his uh, great-grandchildren here also incidentally joined the groups. And so they had a wonderful family reunion. And this is also something lovely for me is that many of the students are actually driving family reunions. Uh, there's a Curitius lady, there's, um, um, yeah, just like a Geldenes. There, there are quite, quite a few of our people doing their families and getting the families together. Cleofas there. Unfortunately, Cleofas passed away uh, earlier this year. 
um, after he's achieved the principalship. So sad about that. Um, but he has done his bit, he has done his journey. That journey, all of us do that journey and all of us get to our own specific um, connections with our ancestors and, and learn to love them. And that the last thing that this brought me to the last level of, of this um, opening up of my heart is actually where I get to that point where I realize that we get boxed into a certain um, doctrine and dogma uh, by governments who are in control. And there will be certain things that will be allowed to be taught in schools. And now is the time for us to actually look at the multifaceted history, the different angles of our history. And for people of color, of indigenous people, um, Koi, Koza, Zulu, Sutu have the right and liberty to actually reconstruct not just our family, but also reconstruct our history. To look at to look at it and make and make the history our own. And 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 all these different facets for me has made me realize that when we go deeper into it, we actually realize that we are all people with strength and weaknesses. We have adopted certain new traditions, our ancestors have, but basically we all flesh and blood and we, we share the same present context. And it's up to me, not to tell other people how to deal with their present context, but it's up to me to deal with my present context in the principle of loving the creator that's in all our main religions and caring for our neighbor like ourselves and i'm sure we can build a better south africa in that way genealogy is the first step thank you thank you that i could talk thank you so much oh so much to to to, to echo 